So my name is Steve Bachelor and uh, I decided that I'd do a talk today about tracking, about basically going out and finding wild animals. So there are lots of different elements to tracking animals, the first of which is a very obvious one. It's basically the tracks they leave behind. And by looking at the size and shape of various tracks, you can try and figure out what animal has left. Anyone get any idea what this might be and what might have created it? Absolute silence, not a single hand up in the air, except the fellow in the middle. Yes, any ideas? It's not actually a snake. Now what this is, is the part of the exoskeleton of a millipede. There is the one single creature that I have spent months and months and months tracking and have never even found sign of. There, in front of our cameras, we caught something which has only been seen by very, very few people in the whole history of natural, natural history filmmaking. Only problem was, the camera hadn't worked, and we hadn't got any of it. It had been a total failure. As you'll see from this next photo, this isn't of a jaguar, this is of a lion. Most species of cats keep their claws, they have retractile claws, which are kept at the end of these pads, and in normal life, as they're walking, as they're moving around, the claws will be retracted into the pads, and so all you see are the toe prints and the heel print, but you don't see the claws extended. Well, let's make a round of applause, most nice to see you. Thank you very much. Identify your weaknesses, practice what you're bad at. Never let fear turn to panic. And you can only manage fear in others if you can man manage it in yourself. Okay, the other thing is fear of discomfort. We now got central heating, double glazing. I don't even have to get out the armchair to turn the TV over. And double glazing, as a kid, we didn't we was lucky to have single glazing. If a window got broke, a bit of carbon went out, that was it. But now we've got all this comfort, and children in particular, they go to their bedrooms and they feel about all these machines and that great. They don't go outdoors. They sat there looking at him. It that last you by years. If you throw a stone, you throw a rock back. What are you going to do about it? Get your mate to do it, okay? <laughs> Don't approach any animal that's wounded or trapped. No matter how sort of innocent they look, squirrels particularly nasty. And any bite or scratch, okay, if you're in a tight situation, it can really go against you, okay? So be careful. The most nutritious part of the animal is the liver. So we don't discard anything, okay? So, plants, fungi, insects, fish, and game. Okay. Again, seasonal, you get nuts, fruits, and berries. We don't waste anything. So the more knowledge you got, it's such a vast subject, and you're learning all the time. And the only way to get familiar is to go out and practice things. Go with someone, especially with a fungi, who knows what they're talking about, see what they gather, and once you've identified it, you'll never forget it, okay? I like to say, experiment on your mate, but keep an eye on your mate, he might be doing the same to you, okay? And then the toad tends to drag on the ground, making a plume of dirt. Now, what does that tell us straight away? It tells us where the guy is going, the direction of his head. There's one thing you can learn, which is a simple thing, but uh, it's an important thing. Right. Now, this is a picture of the same foot striking on the ground. Then we have the heel strike at the back, which is also the primary impact point. You have the foot roll and the toe dip. Tracking with unmanned aerial vehicles, the UAVs, you know all this controversy in America about UAVs, when you follow the news, that's the thing that flies in the sky with a television camera. We're utilizing those in Afghanistan by using the trackers' loss support procedures that many of the UAV pilots have come to us for training. So when they're flying at 6,000 feet up there, but sometimes in, they live in California, they're, they're flying a plane in Afghanistan, which is quite weird. Um, they're actually able to use the tracking technique to locate the spore of bad guys, when they're, not the spore themselves, but where they could have gone. People feel uh, they come upon it sort of coincidentally, and it's happenstance, and it's random. Um, I think people are interested and feel for these animals, and, and, and respect them, and they feel that it might have been around before, and it's not done any harm. Learned to blend in with the countryside yet. It hadn't got its territory sorted, it hadn't worked out to keep, keep to cover and that sort of thing. It was really suspiciously um, obvious. How changes physiologically actually affect the brain and our behaviour. 
Uh, what about brain failures in everyday life? Does anybody experience these or is it just me? Yeah? There are just those occasions where you've lost the keys, you can't find um, the piece of homework that you need, you've got to work and you've forgotten your packed lunch, all those sorts of things. Although the brain seems pretty resilient, you know, having a harpoon put through it, we still seem to have all these errors occurring um, in sort of everyday life. Dehydration, hunger, being tired, and being cold, yeah? So, all these things impact on how the brain works. Homo sapiens have a couple of basic physiological facts stated that you cannot run away from. And at first, we are tropical animals, we are actually at our best in a pair of speedos or similar and a nice beach so so actually and pretty laid back pretty lazy if it drops too far in your extremities like your hands that we as homo sapiens actually need because we are a kind of technician you all realize that without your hands, it takes a while before you can do the same things with your feet. So, one is hypothermia, one is hyperthermia. We have the working fire pit, we have the squash, we have homemade backpacks we've made here with gourd canteens. There's a student, God knows who it is. This was probably from 1994. We have gourd cook pots we're stone boiling in. We have corn cakes we've ground with the mano matate. We're stone cooking over a fire. We have pieces of carp that we've killed um, in the river. So this is kind of a working scene of how it would be. Okay, lobster traps. This is just some, I love the local stuff. And I, you know, I, I'm looking forward to hanging out in England and, and touring around and uh, checking out your country in a little bit more detail than I did when I was sure when I was a little kid. So once again, Cody Lundy. And I wanted bushcraft skills, and actually I looked for survival skills initially. I wanted those skills to augment and act as a backup during the journeys that I was making, specifically a lot of hiking journeys, solo hiking trips both in, in Scotland and further afield in Pyrenees and places like that. So I came to it from the perspective of, I want to learn, what do I do if my stove fails? What do I do if I get stuck somewhere? Here, Norm Dokis, and he lives up on the Dokis uh, Native Reserve up at the top of the French River. And here he is with a bunch of school kids from the local area, they've come in by bus, and he's doing a nature trail with them. And he's educated, some of them are native kids, some of them are white kids, and, um, but he's educating them all about the environment. And uh, he's a very knowledgeable guy. He works for the um, Department of uh, Natural Resources in Canada. It's about that particular day. Does anybody know what it was? Munjack, it wasn't, it wasn't, no, it wasn't either of those, I'm afraid. Um, but um, but uh, um, you're on the right size. Yeah, that's it, you're on the right size, right? Um, another clue on there. This isn't common for every single road deer, but on the neck, there's another little white patch just on the neck there and again that is the only species that has that patch but it doesn't have that patch all of the time so it's a white spot on the neck and that is called a gorget patch okay so if you're using this kind of technology in this country and um, you're going to have problems so hanging a sinew back bow and arrow in a, a, a damp tent for the weekend perhaps wasn't the best move um, but again these cultures that use this overcame that by then covering them with other materials things like snake skins to, to actually waterproof the sinew underneath it and you can use certain tree resins as well. This is a map just to um, put it in your mind's eye of the Hudson Bay area. In purple is uh, Kelsey's first trip. <coughs> and then you see um, Henday's second trip. In fact, you can see it with Henday's trip that he almost reaches the Rocky Mountains. Um, and so he would have seen the Rocky Mountains. I brought what is known as a tracking rig to uh, show you the contents of. Uh, does everybody know what silo is? It's got more than just the use of what it is. Uh, these particular ones are the ones that are issued uh, to the British Army. They're American, made in Paris, brought here, 